Good? Yeah. So. Hmm? Yeah, we should. Yeah. So hello everyone, um, my name is Barnabas Pócos and this is lecture 2 and in this lecture and in the next lecture I will talk about linear programs, how to solve them and what they are. So first administrative questions we need to discuss. This is the most important one, that please ask questions whenever you don't understand something, something is confusing, then don't hesitate to ask. Okay? Second point, Ryan already told you that, that um, the lecture, there will be 40 minutes part, and then five minutes break, and then 30 minutes part, and if I was right, I set up my alarm clock, so it will warn us when I should stop. And, um, the slides can be downloaded from here. And I will try to upload the slides before the lecture, so you can just print them out and bring it here. That might help your life a little bit. Second, or, yeah, another point is that next week there will be an anonym feedback survey on Blackboard, and please use it. So. If you don't like something, tell us that there. If you like something, you can tell us that there too. Um, I think it's important that if you don't like something, then you should tell us as soon as possible. So it doesn't make sense to complain about something at the end of the semester, right? So then we can change things. And the other thing is subscribe for scribing. Su subscribe for scribing. Uh, Ryan already told you about this, right? So you know what this is. Okay, and finally my office hour is after this class. So if you have questions, you can just walk to my office and discuss your questions there. <coughs> So we will start with some basic definitions that we will need to define linear programs. And first thing is that um, what will be our goal? We want to uh, minimize the function f of x, right, or maximize function f of x and we want to discuss more and more complicated problems so what's the simplest possible function you can think of that we need to minimize so tell me a function function quadratic simpler function Think about the title of this. Linear. Linear, okay. Or an even simpler function, constant function, right? But that doesn't make much sense, but um, right, it's pretty trivial. Um, so we can think of constant functions. Fx is c, and the minimum is c, maximum is c. So second, more complicated, is a linear function say a x plus b that's f of x what's the minimum of this i hope you can solve this so x can be any real number what's the minimum of this 
minus infinity, good. What's the maximum of this? Very good. Okay, let's move on. What if I have uh, bounds? So let's say this is f of x, ax plus b, and I know that x should be between c and d. What's the minimum of this function? Minimum point? C maximum point D, right, if A is non-negative. Okay, so we are good with linear functions. <clears throat> so let's move on. And uh, let's discuss n-dimensional linear functions. Uh, so then our cost function is C1 x1 plus C2 x2 plus da 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 cn xn and we can have constraints as well so subject to a11 x1 plus a12 x2 a1n xn this is say less than b1 and i can have m constraints so a m1 x1 plus a m two x two plus a m n x n is b m, right? And we can have um, constraints on the bounds too. So say l one is less or equal than x one, and x one is upper bounded by u one. We have n variables, so l n x n u n oops yes so and of course these um, bounds l i it can be say minus infinity or plus infinity too is this definition clear right uh, so we want to discuss in this lecture and next lecture how to solve uh, these linear programs Okay, I can write uh, the previous problem using matrix and vector notations too, right? And then in that case, the co um, cost function is just C transpose X, where X is in the n-dimensional n Euclidean space. And the constraints, I can just write with matrix notations like this, that AX is less or equal than B, where B is a vector, and A is a matrix. And you can think of uh, vector, L, vector L and vector U as well, where they are in the n-dimensional Euclidean space. Do you want to switch to dimension? Yes, I want to. OK, I'm lazy. OK. So that's clear so far, right? Questions? Oh, very good. And um, so an ex example, so say we want to minimize, um, say this function, minus 2x1 minus x2, subject 2. Um, whatever we want. Okay, and if I want, I can uh, rewrite this whole thing with matrix notation too. So please help me. What's C vector in this case? Minus to minus one. Minus one. Okay, we need a vector B. Uh, you want to transpose? Yes. Uh, vector B. transpose and matrix A I cannot hear you well sorry 
one, one, two, three. Cool. So we know this. Okay. So the goal of this and next lecture will be to solve these kind of problems, and we will discuss an algorithm for that. That's called the simplex algorithm, which will have to fit yes. A very good point. So, just to define the problem, I can. There's uh, no difference, right? But uh, for the algorithm that we will use, it will be important that we will have always. We will use these constraints, x1 and x2. They will always be non-negative. Oh, so you will start with the linear programs where you might have different constraints, but we will see how to transform the linear programs to this form where we will have these kind of constraints, and we can run the simplex algorithm that requires these non-negative uh, constraints on uh, the variables. Is it clear? Good. OK, uh, later we will see other algorithms too when we discuss interior point methods. Um, the other goal of these lectures are to understand why linear pro uh, problems are useful. So we will see some motivating examples and applications in machine learning. I chose machine learning because I'm from that department, so it's a selfish choice, but I hope you will like the example there. And we also need to understand the difficulties. So how difficult are these problems that we just discussed, these linear programs? So the algorithm that we will propose, will it converge or won't? How many operations we need to solve the problem? So is it polynomial in the size of the problem or exponential? And will the algorithms find the exact solutions or are they just approximated? So we need to understand uh, these questions and we, no need to, we, we want to answer all of them. Is it clear so far? OK, so this is the table of contents. So I will talk about uh, a classification problem in machine learning and how to describe a classification problem as a linear program. And we will uh, discuss different forms of linear programs, such as the standard form, form and canonical form. We need to define um, these terms here, such as basic solution, feasible solution, optimal solution, degenerate solution. And uh, finally, we will discuss this simplex, simplex algorithm. OK? So the goal of this lecture and the next lecture is clear so far. Good. So let's see some, uh, in this block, some motivating, motivating examples and a little bit of the history of linear programs. And then we will sketch a linear program. OK, so the whole story started around 1947, when Danzig proposed the simplex algorithm. And according to a leading computer science journal, this is one of the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century. So even though you might never use it, you should know it. The theory of linear programs, they were motivated by problems in uh, World War II. There were problems there like job scheduling. So for example, you wanted to assign 70 men to 70 jobs, where we have some constraints that each job has to be done with someone. Um, there might be some ordering between the jobs and so on. Another problem that was pretty common those years is a blending problem. See, your goal is to produce a blend that contains 30% lead, 30% zinc, 40% tin. And you can buy, say, nine different alloys that contain different percentage of this uh, material. And you want to blend them in such a way that the final blend will contain this percentage of these materials. And these nine different alloys, they might have different costs as well. So you want to purchase some quantity in such a way that in your final blend, you will have these percentages of the different materials. And 
you want to produce this using having minimal cost. Other problems are, say, network flow optimization, where you want to transport some material from one point to another point, and you can choose different routes and how to solve that in an optimal way, where the routes might have some capacity. So you cannot send more mm, material on one route than its capacity. OK, or well, here is another concrete example. Um, see, you have a furniture company that uh, manufactures four models of desks. And each desk, to, to produce a desk, uh, you have to um, ship it to a carpentry shop and then to a finishing shop. And each desk requires some man hours on labor. So for example, desk one requires four, hour, four hours in the carpentry shop, then one hour's finishing. And it can make you $12 profit. Similarly, say desk two, it needs nine hours uh, to be in the carpentry shop, and then one hour in the finishing shop, but it can make you $20 profit. And you have a overall constraints that in the carpentry shop you cannot spend more than 6,000 hours and in the finishing shop you cannot spend more than 4,000 hours. The question is how to, uh, how many desk one, desk two, desk three, desk four to pro uh, produce in order to maximize your profit. Is it clear? Okay, and the solution is this, that of course we will have, so we will produce x1, x2, x3, x4, um, oops, sorry, not this much. So X for desks. And uh, the maximum profit would be 12 times X1 plus 20 times X2 plus, eight, plus 18 times X3 plus 40 times X4. Right? So this is what you want to maximize. And of course, you have these constraints that the linear combinations of uh, 4, 9, Seven and ten. Um, you just forget x5 is less than six thousand, and x1 plus x3 plus three x3 plus uh, 40x4 is less than four thousand. So, why do I have that x5 and x6 is there? Any guess why I made this mistake? Yeah, they are flat variables actually. So the original problem is this: this is less than. 6,000, 4,000, and I got confused, so I brought, right, x5 here, x6 here, and then it should be equal to 6,000 and 4,000. Um, okay, so apart from this confusion, the problem is clear, right? Question? No. Clear? If something is not clear, do this, or raise your hand, or your guy next to you with his hand, or... <laughs> So somehow tell me if something is confusing. OK, so here is my question. Why is it called linear programming? Why is it called linear? So one is that those years they use the programming in a different context, the and scheduling and the programming can be used for for scheduling for that's one. Another context I Second is that those years the computers got more and more popular and it was easier to get grants if you go the type of program. <laughs> <laughs> because then the dark and the US Air give you more. And so I don't know, you can do this one to this, but this type of two information that I do. <clears throat> okay, so why we like linear programming? Because Probably this is the simplest non-trivial optimization problem 
we can think of. And many complex systems, even if they are not linear, they can be well approximated with linear equations. And then linear program can approximate the solutions. There are many important applications, and there are efficient toolboxes that can solve huge linear programs. So let's see. <clears throat> Sketching a linear program. So here is an example. We want to minimize in x minus 2x1 minus x2, and I denote the cost function with z. And we have constraints such as x1 plus x2 is uh, not bigger than 5, 2x1 plus 3x2 is not bigger than 12. We have constraints that x1 is not bigger than 4, and x1 and x2 they are non negative. So here is a coordinate system, and let's see what happens. So this is x1, that one is x2, some ticks. And this is my cost function, minus 2x1 minus x2 is z. So this is what we want to minimize. And uh, you can observe that uh, Let's discuss it later. So first, uh, let's see the equation. So say x1 is 4. So this is just this line here. We have another inequality. That's x1 plus x2 is uh, less than equal than 5. So I draw this equation. And finally, the second constraint is that 2x1 plus 3x2 is less than equal than 12. OK, so we have these constraints. That's clear so far, right? And now the question is, if I want to minimize this, where to push this such that it will have a minimum value in z? OK? Uh, some definition, this domain here is called feasible set. So those points that satisfy uh, these constraints, they are feasible. And we can also observe that uh, this, is, um, this object has um, one, two, three, four, five corners. I can denote this with O and then A, B, C, D, the other corners. And any guess, if I want to solve this optimization problem, where would be this, the, where would be the optimum? What would happen? Yeah, so what happens if I uh, change z, then this gets shifted, right? And we need to shift this somewhere where it's still feasible, but it's maximally shifted. So where will be that? Yeah, it will be in c. Right? So it's very crucial that you should see this. If you cannot see this, then tell me now. Otherwise, you will have difficulties later. OK, and so this is optimum. The optimum is at C. And you can just read the optimal solution is x1 star is 4, x2 star is 1. And you can calculate the z value of c star using this equation, and that will be OK. So a few more definitions. That uh, these points inside, we call them, um, so these are the feasible points, but they are also suboptimal because they are not optimal. And inside of these constraints, there are no active, inside of this region, there are no active constraints. And uh, see, on an edge, there's one active constraint. And in a corner, there are two active uh, constraints. Right? Both of these are active. OK. So what the simplex algorithm will do, it, we will see that uh, it starts from a feasible point, say from here, and it jumps on the corners till it 
finds the optimal solution. So we will be able to prove that the optimal solution is always in corner. And then the simplex algorithm will just jump from one corner to a neighboring one till it finds the optimal solution. And it might jump this way too. Uh, depending on depends on what kind of uh, variant of the simplex algorithm you use. Any question so far? With this, it's clear. Good. Okay. So some difficulties is that first the feasible set might not exist. So it might happen that uh, the equations they contradict to each other, and then there's no feasible point. Uh, the other difficulties is that there might be infinite many global optimum. So for example, if a whole edge contains uh, the global optimum, so it's not a corner then. And depending on the system you want to solve, the inf infinitum can be minus infinity or plus infinity. So we need an algorithm that can handle all these problems. Question? Yeah. Oh, I just meant that uh, you mean this, that the object is infinite many global. That uh, the global optimum is not a single point, but the um, <coughs> the whole yeah, whole edge. Right. So, for example, if the cost function is parallel. So if you are, um, you want to see more information, more details about this, then you can look at these uh, slides here. And our goal is now to show that uh, linear programming can be used for solving linear classification. Why would you ever use LPEs? Is the only reason is that there are efficient LP solvers. So you can use them to solve uh, huge classification problems. <clears throat> so, our formal goal is that uh, given two sets, one is H, contains vectors H1, H2, H, H, in the n-dimensional Euclidean space, and we have another set, say M, M1, M2, MM points, right? So we have these two sets. And the first problem is to determine whether H and M, they are linearly separable. And the second problem if, is if they are linearly separable, then we want to find a separating hyperplane. So here is an example for a linearly separable set. So say this is H, this is M, and we want to find this line here. And it is an example for a linearly not separable set. So you cannot put a line between the red and blue block. points that would separate uh, these sets. OK, so the first observation is very trivial. <coughs> I'm just saying that H and M, they are linearly separable if and only if there exists vector A in the n-dimensional Euclidean space and the B, pay our number, such that
H is a subset of those x points in the Euclidean and dimensional Euclidean space with which A transpose x is say bigger than B and M is a subset of these points where A transpose x is not bigger than B. Is it clear? So this is just the definition of what it means linearly separable. Right? Good. And um, our first lemma oops. is uh, this, that let H and M be these two sets. And we are saying that they are linearly separable if and only if there exists A in the n-dimensional Euclidean space and B real number such that, and now comes the tricky part, A transpose H I minus B. I'm saying that it's bigger than plus one for all points in this set and for the other set using the M points this is less than minus one for G. So let these sets be strictly separable then what I'm saying that I can scale, I can find A and B such that uh, I can write this plus one here and this minus one here. Okay, so the linear, just the definition that they are linear is separable, it doesn't mean that I can find the plus one and minus one, we need to prove that. Right, so uh, one side is trivial that if uh, this direction, this is trivial. If there exists H and B in this property, then of course that's linearly separable. But we need to prove this other deduction too. Ideas how to prove it, or you can see it, or how difficult is it to prove. So, for example, if it's a midterm question, then you would be very mad or super happy. way to do it. <clears throat> okay, so what we know, what we just discussed is uh, so from the definition we know that there is exists a I use C and B such that C transpose X is always 
bigger than uh, B and C trans when the points are in H and C transpose X is not bigger than B when the points are in M. And we need to find an A and B. And um, I'm just saying that let's say um, P number defined, so this is the minimum of C transpose X minus when X is in H and maximum of C transpose, oops, C transpose X. then x is in m. Right? So what do we know about uh, this difference? So I know that the C trans minimum C transpose X, when X is in H, it will be bigger than B, right? The maximum when we are in set M, it will be less than B. So I know that this is never negative, right? Okay. Um, Yes, it's uh, it can be zero too. So if uh, if they are strictly separable, it cannot be zero. If uh, they are not strictly separable, then it could be zero, right? Oh, okay. So so you mean that definition? Oh, uh, I cannot hear it. What I want is that this is bigger than zero. That's okay. Good. Clear? Now we are good. Okay. So let's move on. If I can move on. Okay, so we have this. <coughs> and uh, I have we have to have five minutes break now. So then we will continue, okay? In the break, you can think about the rest of the The point is, it's, now it's clear it's not, it cannot yeah, be zero. All straight, like big yeah.
Finite, finite oh, yeah. sets of oh, points. It's, oh, it's a points. It's final points, close sets, but the final point of So we just uh, say in each set, set each, we have each different number of points, and then set M, we have M different number of points. Oh, no, points. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. yeah. Not just points as close sets. Yes. 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 Yeah, I just it's it's a little bit nicer here with the fan, but it's, I feel there's no fan. Uh, and the other problem, I think I have fever. Um, really? Yeah, because I'm coughing and I'm sweating. Yeah. 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 Okay. I can yeah. take over. No, no, no. <coughs> Yeah, it should be equal to make a difference. Yeah, it was not clear, I know. Uh, but we did have more slides in the black body version, so it should be a bit more okay. Is it clear? <coughs> Okay, so let's continue. Then the question about supplementary and cleaning as a request. So, it is a book. So, it's written by them to invest in the simple project. And this is a pretty good introduction to the network. I mean, it says this is what you want, but that's what you want. This is what you want. This is what you want. This is what you want. If I give it to you, you can. You got bored and then you read it, but at the end of the lecture, I don't think you can take a look at it. So you might like it, it's pretty much pretty fun. <coughs> So linear programming, it's really huge. So we will have only two lectures on it. But when I studied it, we had two semesters. And it was called Introduction to Linear Programming. <laughs> OK, so this is where we start, that we have this uh, real number p. And we know that it's uh, positive. And uh, <coughs> using that p, uh, 
let me define a vector as 2 over p times c and let b defined by as 1 over p times the minimum of c transpose x where x is in h plus the maximum of c transpose x again where x is in m. <coughs> so that's why it was important that the p is uh, positive, right? Otherwise it would be difficult to divide by it. If it can be zero. So this is how we define a and b. And now we just need to prove that this a and b will be good for us to have this property clear. Definition of a and b is clear. Okay, <coughs> and now what we have is that the minimum of this C transpose X, X is in H, Oops. let me start differently, so let calculate the minimum of A transpose X. So what is what we need to prove that, just to remind you that your M is this. Right, we want to prove that this uh, minimum of A transpose X Okay, I was wrong. I missed H and M. So let's... So I, I need to prove that the minimum of A transpose H is at least 1 plus B, right? So let's <coughs> go there. So what's this minimum A transpose X? We, we just defined A. <coughs> P, P, C transpose X. What's the definition of minimum? What's the definition of <coughs> Let's do this. So let's let me uh, just rewrite. So it's uh, minimum two over P C transpose X. Let me divide this as minimum one over P, and I just write it C transpose X plus C transpose X. One over P minimum power. I don't need to care, right? Minimum C. And I want to use the definition of P. So what was P? P was defined here, so I just write this is maximum C transpose X, X is in M plus P. <coughs> so 
Do you follow me? What I did? So we started with minimum A transpose X, X is in H, and I just uh, used the definition of A, which was 2 over PC, I uh, put that here, and I have these two, I just uh, rewrite this as uh, minimum 1 over P and C tra transpose X plus C transpose X, and for this uh, C transpose X, I used the definition of P, which was uh, defined here, so this is maximum C transpose X plus P. I see some here, some one sleeping. Is it clear? Good. <coughs> okay, so what we have that this is one over P minimum C transpose. C transpose X plus maximum C transpose X plus P and now we are in good shape because what is this thing here <coughs> just think of the definition of B So I'm a bit lazy, but whenever you, I just write mean, of course I mean that minimum on X, and whenever I just write maximum on M, okay? So what is this 1 over P times this, that's B, and we have P over P, that's 1. So we, what we proved is that minimum A transpose X, X is in H, that's B plus 1. And this is what we wanted to prove, if you think of this theorem. Right, so the minimum of this A transpose x, when x is in h, it's always at least b plus 1. And we need to do this for the other direction as well. Yes? So I just want, so you can I, uh, but I want to have exactly plus one and minus Yeah, we constructed uh, A and B from C, and it was just one line, the definition, right? That's all. There are many other ways to do it. 
Is it clear? Okay. <clears throat> So for the other direction, we just um, you just do the same uh, thing that we uh, we did. The details are in the slides. You can check at home. Okay, but let's move on. So you can prove that the maximum of a transpose x will be b minus one. So now this is what we have is. Um, so we prove that a transpose x when x is in h, it's always at least b plus 1. And when x is in m, it's uh, maximum b minus 1. And this is how this can be demonstrated. So we have the equations a transpose x is b. And this is a transpose x is b plus 1. And this is a transpose x is uh, b minus 1 and it separates uh, these two classes. OK, and after this, that, then here is a linear program that we can prove that separates the classes. So we have these sets, h and m. And our variab variables will be y and z. They will be like error terms. Y is <coughs> In the h dimensional Euclidean space, so we have h number of points, so f is h. And z is um, in the m dimensional, work is m dimensional Euclidean space. For each point here, we have a z i. We want to find a and b. Um, such that these are the constraints. So it looks a bit complicated, but actually it's very simple. So we want to minimize 1 over h times the sum of y's plus 1 over m times the sum of z's. So these are like errors. They will be non-negative. So we have yi is uh, always non-negative, dj is always non-negative. And uh, we have uh, these other constants that yi is always bigger than minus a times plus a, h plus b plus 1 in uh, the H group. And of course, dj is always bigger than a transpose mj minus b plus 1 in the uh, other group, the m group. OK, and now the theorem is that h and m are linearly separable if and only if the optimal value of this linear program is 0. So we have a classification problem, and then we could <coughs> reply the classification pro problem as a linear program. Is the linear program clear, the definition? Clear? <coughs> and theorem 2 is H and M are linearly separable, and y star, z star, a star, b star is an optimal value of this linear program, then f of x, a star transpose x plus b star is a separating hyperplane. Yes?
and you can see that y and z they are always non-negative. So this cost function it can be neg never negative, right? What happens when this cost function is zero? It means that <coughs> all z, zj and yi, they are zeros. And it means that, uh, say, zero is always bigger or equal than a transpose mg minus b plus 1 in the m group. And we also have that this one that yi is always, so if it's zero, then zero is always bigger or equal than minus h transpose h plus b plus one uh, in the h group. And this is what we prove that uh, classes in are separable if and only if these two is true with zeros. Right, so <clears throat> this is what we can see. So uh, optimal value of L is zero, then if and only if phi star is zero, Z star is zero, and right, you know that. And it, in that case, A transpose H I is bigger than B star plus one for all <coughs> I one to H. And we also have that A transpose M I less or equal than B star minus one for all j in the m group. And now you use the previous theorem that we just proved. This one. H and M are linearly separable if and only if there is exists an A and B such that this holds. And the linear program says that if the solution of that linear program is zero, then the solution has uh, these properties. Is it clear? No. So we just, just think of this as error when you make a mistake in the uh, classification. When you make a classification, when you make a mistake, by i would be negative or be Yeah, And we want to be that if that zero, then Okay. So now we have a program, we can for classification. You can use this for classification. What can be the properties of this? When you use properties? So if you have further maximum multiplier, can it be as the maximum multiplier? Maybe not, that is the error margin. It's the error that you want to make the classification. So if the two classes are inaccessible, then the cost function is zero. Okay, <coughs> and uh, this is used this uh, linear program, this classification system is used in real programs as well. So, for example, the universe of this system, they, they use this method to do red cancer. So, what they do is that they sample some, two in sample from that. And they place this uh, sample on the left and say uh, to highlight the size of the cell, then they take changes of the sample and they use 
Usually it depends, yeah, so it's, uh, usually it's very fast to solve LP problems, but you might have difficulty with that because that it really depends on the linear problem. So you can try those algorithms, it's um, probably just computational issue. Otherwise, to what happens is not, then you could do this that and then we fight that, we start, they would not be able to do the scenario. Okay, so let's move on. And <coughs> let's discuss the stand standard form, canonical uh, forms, and inequality form of linear problems. And then we will see how to transform linear uh, programs, and um, we will discuss the so-called pivot transformation that will be very crucial for the simplex algorithm. Okay, so we already discussed this actually. That this is what's called the inequality form of linear programs using matrix notation. That we want to minimize or maximize the cost function c transpose x. That is in the n-dimensional Euclidean space. We have some linear constraints. Constraint a transpose x is not bigger than b, and x vector is between l vector and u vector, where the between is a coordinate wise uh, order. Okay, so this is the inequality form, and the standard form of linear programs, say, uh, is that we want to minimize. So in standard form, we always want to minimize. C transpose x. But again, C is in the n-dimensional Euclidean space, such that A times x is B. So it's strict. So it's not inequality, it's equation. And we have this other constant, that x is non-negative. And sometimes people re also require, but it's not always the case, that 
the vector b is non-negative as well. Is it clear what we mean on standard form of LP? And the theorem that we have is that any linear program from that form can be rewritten to this form. How trivial is this? Not two, not, not at all. So if it's a midterm question, then you would come out of the room or you could prove it in the Okay, so let's see. <coughs> so ho how can we, so remember this is the inequality form. How can we get rid of the inequalities? So for example, if I have x1 plus x2 less than four, or not bigger than four, then I can just rewrite this as this. That using slack variables, right? x1 plus x2 plus x3 is 4, where I have this other constraint that x3 is non-negative. Right? By the way, if um, you could do the opposite too, if um, at some point you want in your life that, say if you have a equation, then it's equivalent to this. x1 plus x2 is not smaller than 4 and not bigger than 4. So you could rewrite equations in a creative design. Okay, so how can we get rid of negative variables? So here we have this very strict condition that all the variables, they have to be non-negative. But in the original form, we just had some bounds, right? So what can we do when we have negative variables? Or, so uh, what can we do if, say, in the original problem, we had this that x is in, x is a real number. What should I do with this? To have, to rewrite the linear program with non-negative variables. So I want to everything to keep linear. So I don't want to use absolute values and so on. Yeah, that's yeah. So that's that's a simpler. That let me just write that x is the u minus v, where u is real, v is real. Okay. Okay. Just yeah. I just didn't want to say absolute values. Okay. Yes, exactly. Oops. Good point. Yeah, that was the goal, right? So, okay. How can we get rid of bounded variables? So, for example, if I have x is in, in two and five, that well, I can just add this. to A and to the matrix A. I want. Okay, if I have <coughs> this mark to calculate maximum C transpose X, but I can solve only minimization problems, that one ca what can I do? Okay, and what can I do if uh, in the vector B a component is negative? How can I make it non-negative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I just, 
uh, multiply that row of matrix A with minus one. Right? I rewrite the whole thing to equations, and then I can just multiply both sides with minus one in that row. So AI transpose X is BI depends only if minus AI transpose X is minus BI. Okay, so if you just use these bets, then that proves this. So the lesson is from now on, we will focus on these kind of problems. Is it okay? You will be happy? You are not saying I was cheating because we didn't consider all in our problems. So this is an important step. Are you happy with this? Good. Yeah, I think I should stop soon. This is so if we have a system in an inequality form, then it's just an example, and I want to rewrite it into standard form, then we can use those steps, say I cannot add these variables, and we got what we needed. Let me skip just this. And in the last minute, I just want to mention this very important transformation, it's called pivot transformation. Have you ever heard about this? Who have heard about that? Who haven't? Very good. So what we do here is that uh, we choose an, this is the original problem, we choose a non-zero element in this matrix A, so say for example I can see that the uh, multiplier of x for is 3, 3 is non-zero, I choose that. And I'm saying that I'm going to make a pivot there, which means that I want to modify the coefficients of this to 1, and I want to use this equation to cancel x4 from the other equation. So we will divide these equations by 3, and then subtract this equation from this and this, and that eliminates x4 from the other equation. Okay, so we will continue with this next Tuesday, and then hopefully we can finish things next method. So if you have questions, then just come to my office hours.